Bullshit. Let's pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe, free of bullshit marketing and full of bold solutions. That's what the No Bullshit Marketing Podcast is all about. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich, and our guest this episode is Tony Lombardi, a former healthcare chief executive and a past winner of the Lifetime Achievement Healthcare Hero Award. Our Sights and Sounds of Marketing has David Bowie telling us about ch changes and goes back to when everybody was kung fu fighting. But first, let's cut the bullshit. When someone leaves a company, why do they and most of their coworkers rarely stay in touch for more than a few months? How do former bosses and mentors become just memories instead of being part of an ongoing win-win relationship? Why do friendships turn into acquaintances and then move to someone I used to know? The reasons range from trivial to ridiculous, but the relationship was disposable rather than indispensable. How can we avoid this? First, acknowledge there's no such thing as a perfect relationship. Okay, we can all agree on that. The hard part is doing it. For example, instead of only remembering criticism from a former boss, focus on the positives of the relationship. Second, overlook the imperfections in others. I know, another straightforward yet difficult to implement piece of advice. Try not to concentrate on how your former coworkers bugged you. Remember, most days they actually agreed with you and you got along 80% of the time. We all have different expectations from each relationship. Sometimes people don't even realize they're making the relationship one-sided. In other cases, your styles may be completely different and you'll have to compensate by being creative and forgiving. You also might want to tactfully let the other party know where you're coming from and what your expectations are. Look at each relationship in a different light. Make them indispensable rather than disposable and both parties will reap the benefits. Hey, I never said it was easy. Our guest today is Tony Lombardi. He's riding it on a motorcycle. <laughs> uh, Tony's a former healthcare system CEO who also was involved with the outreach for the American Hospital Association and was board chair of the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania. He's been recognized for his leadership successes with many awards throughout his distinguished career. Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. It's good for me to be here. Tell us a little bit more about your background and your impressive career. Well, uh, my background includes an MBA from the George Washington University with a major in healthcare administration. I spent 41 years with the Monongahela Valley Hospital Health System, which uh, previously was two former hospitals, and I know we'll get into that later, but was merged into, or I should say consolidated into Monongahela Valley Hospital. I uh, retired from there in 2004, did some consulting in risk management, workers' compensation, and, uh, you know, dabbled around in a few things like that. But basically for the past two or three years, I've just been enjoying the good life. Yes, and you deserve it. And I want to tell everybody a little bit of background. First, I, I always thank Tony. Uh, early in my career, he took a chance on me, and uh, he taught me a lot, and uh, uh, we went... Uh, head to head a lot because we challenged each other and neither of us are BS leaders and we got a lot out of it. And one of the things I always liked about what Tony's background is, there's a number of things, but the first I want to talk about is that master's program uh, that you went through. I remember when I first met you, you told me about that master's program. I know we're going to get into that a little bit, but just talk about how that was ahead of its time and the type of education you were getting that's now commonplace but wasn't back then. Well, I had worked in the hospital since I was uh, 16 years old in my native uh, town of Newark, New Jersey. I washed dishes and pots and pans after school and on weekends and including holidays, including Christmas Day. So I knew a little bit about hospitals, but of course the residency that, that takes part of the master's program, uh, and I don't believe they still do residencies today, but back then uh, the second year of your master's program was to spend a year in a hospital doing a residency and rotating throughout the entire hospital system. I was lucky enough to go to Chicago Western Memorial Hospital, which has since also had a merger and a consolidation, is now Northwestern Memorial Hospital. 900 beds. Uh, the hospital across the street, which was Pasadena Hospital, uh, was uh, had as a chairman of surgery Dr. Loyal G. Davis, who happened to be the father of Nancy Reagan. So it was a very, very prestigious hospital, a very, very prestigious healthcare system. One of the best things about that residency was that on Saturdays and Sundays, the resident became the hospital CEO that day. 
And uh, I thought that was a lot of BS because I knew that working in hospitals since I was 16, that when the CEO is not there, the nurses were in the hospital. But that was not the case because this was 1963 and I was about the 20th or more resident and the nurses gladly gave up that responsibility during the past two decades. And so they began knocking on my door or calling me up as early as 9.30 in the morning, even though I wasn't supposed to report until 1.30 in the afternoon. I guess my best experience was the first weekend that I, that I uh, did my stunt as the CEO of the hospital. Uh, I was getting ready to go off duty. I was supposed to go off duty at 9.30 at night. I was getting ready to go off duty. when all of a sudden there was a major fire in Chicago at three flop houses. This is where those people used to sleep for a quarter a night. You didn't know what their name was. You didn't care what the name was. All you wanted was to do was get their quarter and let them sober up or do whatever the heck they had to do in these flop houses. Anyway, you can imagine with three flop houses and people coming in with no identification and police and fire and all these unidentified vi victims. Uh, we saved them all. It was about uh, one o'clock in the morning when we had them all identified. And all I remember was leaning up against the outside wall of the hospital, lighting up a cigarette and saying, I guess this is what it's all about. Great story. Great story. So, Tony, we've all seen it, or should I say smelled it, bullshit in the workplace. Give me an example of a time when you just shook your head. It could be a company culture, questionable leadership, poor work ethic, a time when you just had to say, that's bullshit. Well, you know, I, I, I guess as I think back, uh, when I said that's bullshit, it referred to the federal government, and it was bullshit then, and it's bullshit now, and it'll probably be bullshit for the next couple of decades. But uh, that's when, you know, I, I preceded Medicare, so I had to implement Medicare. And at first, Medicare was pretty easy to work with, and then all of a sudden, the government felt that they were paying hospitals and they were paying doctors too much money. And they came out with all these rules and regulations and new payment systems, and every time we responded as a healthcare industry as a medical industry with something to be able to survive these new rules and regulations the government just called them loopholes and kept sewing them up and so we had to constantly constantly try to try to put up with the bullshit of the government being involved in medicine it should never have been involved in medicine it's even more so than it was then and i'm happy to be out of it so so uh you're a fan of obamacare oh i'm uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a complete fan of obamacare who can afford it I mean, there was an article in the newspaper this morning that, you know, uh, the people, the, the companies can't afford it. The people can't afford it. I mean, by, by the time you get through buying all these plans that they have, there are still 30 million people today uninsured despite Obamacare. When you and I work together, there's a number of things I'm going to touch on today. Uh, and at the forefront of that, just when, after Hillary had her program, there was originally Hillary Care. Uh, you and I got the chance to work together under the Clinton administration. I'm going to bring up some of the things that you did there. I think you were ahead of your time on a couple of things with trying to build a system in relationship to, there was one big system here in Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. You were way ahead of your time trying to get Connemal Health System and Johnstown, a very strong system, and West Penn and Allegheny General and Monongahela Valley and a couple of others to form together. And I always thought that each time I saw that happening after the fact, I always thought back to you pushing for that back in 97, 98. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we never did accomplish that, what we set out to do. But the one thing that we did do that is still uh, viable today is we formed our own uh, uh, insurance company for medical liability. So that, uh, you know, because at that point in time, there was a real, real big a crisis. And that crisis reinvents itself every so many years, whereby, you know, you can no longer afford malpractice insurance. Uh, you know, well, I, every patient today wants to sue. Uh, and, uh, and and so the insurance companies just, you know, respond by higher and higher premiums. So by assuming our own risk with a big health system such as West Penn and a major hospital in West Warren County, such as uh, Greensburg and up at Johnstown, Connemaw and Monongahela Valley, uh, the fruit of that effort still pers uh, still persists today, whereby we have our own liability insurance company. And so for our listeners, not necessarily from Western Pennsylvania, there are two big players in the market now, uh, Highmark, which is with Allegheny Health Network, 
and UPMC. And UPMC was in place when Tony and I worked together and he was pushing to get this other system. The other system came to fruition in a different way, but he was talking about some of the benefits of the system that you helped lead and build back in the day. So now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit uh, when maybe you were a BS marketer, a tough boss, or maybe a difficult employee, or maybe your communication wasn't what it needed to be. Uh, what's your biggest learning experience? And looking back, when do you think you might have been guilty of some BS? Well, you know, I was a difficult guy to work with. I mean, you know, uh, as much as I, I love the people that I work with, you know, at, at times that can be very, very demanding and very, very bossy. And <clears throat> pardon me, that, that reflected itself when I first started taking administrative residence. I explained the residency program that I went through in Chicago. Well, then I became a preceptor for George Washington University, and I've had several, precept, uh, several uh, students go through the residency program with me. And there were times that uh, I felt that I wanted the, respond the resident to take on more responsibility to do more things, not to come and ask me what has to be done next. And then there were times that when they did do that, I wanted to pull them back and say, hey, you know, you're just a student. You're not supposed to be making these kinds of decisions or doing these kinds of things. So I was sending out a bullshit message. Hey, hey, you want me to be independent. You want me to learn. But here you want to pull me in and pull me back. So that was a, an adjustment for me to have to make. How did you adjust to that over the years with the residents? Did you, over a couple of years, start to learn on that? Uh, yeah, I learned on that, and I, and, I, and I guess I delegated more with trust. You know, there's a, there was a catchphrase word that started toward the end of my career. It's not such, so much of a catchphrase as it, today as it was then, but it was called empowerment. And to me, empowerment is bullshit. I can't empower anyone to do anything, but I can trust them. And I'd like to substitute the word empower to trust. And as I learned to trust more, not only the administrative residents, but the vice presidents that reported directly to me, I was able to pull back and let them do their thing. Nothing pleased me more than one of my vice presidents who constantly challenged me every time. And I will not mention the name or the sex because you might even recognize who it is. But every time this person started to give a report, I would be ready to interject. So the person finally told me, let me finish my report, sit back, mind your own business, and when I am through, you can question me whatever you want to question me, but I'm going to finish my report first. That, you know, made me understand that, you know, I have to trust these people more. You know, people come to work in the morning and they have a lot of different backgrounds. You have people that are working for you. They might be the president of the city council where they live. They may be the president of the PTA. There are all these organizations and we expect them to put their smarts in the glove compartment of their car, come into work and be dumb and listen to whatever the boss says. It doesn't work that way. I want to touch on that empowerment of BS <clears throat> and the word trust because I want to make sure we can explain what you think because I think I know where you're going with that. The term empowerment implies that like we can take someone and say, here, go, you now have the power. And I think what you're saying is, as a leader, you trust and then they do, That's they have right. to be self-motivated. That's absolutely right. I don't empower them, but I trust them. I give them the job and I trust them to get the job done. And if they need any help along the way, they can come and ask me. If not, I'm not going to bug them until the job is done. That's a good example, Tony, <clears throat> of uh, taking something that was BS uh, when you were early doing, early in your teaching the residents to now turning into a big strength. One of the things I've learned over the years is a, is marketing and the true definition of marketing. It's about clearly defining your target markets, finding out what they want, developing it if you don't already have it, and then giving it to them when and where they want it at a price they're willing to pay, and then telling them about it again and again. And you know I'm passionate about this because most people think marketing is that telling them about it again and again. And they get hung up on the creative and this, this cool message or the website but they didn't do real marketing, which was finding out, first clearly defining those target markets, finding out what they want, coming back and tweaking your product to give them that when and where they want it at a price they're willing to pay. If you do that, then the telling them about it again and again can be something fun. So the question I have for you is, based on that definition of marketing, think back to what has been your most amazing moment in your experience with marketing, messaging, or communications. What's your biggest marketing or messaging success? Well. 
After I finished my stint as chairman of the board of the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania, I was tapped by an organization. This was 1991. I was tapped by that organization to lead a three-year process called Healthcare Vision 2000. <laughs> 2000 is now 15 years old, but back there is what's healthcare going to look like in 2000. And, and in doing this, uh, my committee consisted not only of healthcare people, but we had the superintendent of schools, we had labor, we had management, we had uh, all different kinds of disciples to try to figure out healthcare 2000. One of the things that came out of that was that, you know, if you want to deliver healthcare in 2000, you want to know what kind of healthcare you have to deliver. And so we talked about assessment. Assess your community. What are the healthcare needs? So at Monongahela Valley, we started a, a committee called MATCH, M-A-T-C-H. Now, Monongahela Valley Hospital is part of a system. Our parent organization is Monvale Health Resources. So MATCH was Monvale Advances Total Community Health. The first thing we did is we called out to the community so that we could have at least one or not or two, and most of the time it was two people from each of the communities that we serve to meet once a month to begin doing healthcare assessments. Uh, some things were health related. I remember one community had a, a, a pocket of a particular illness that uh, it was just permeated throughout the community and they wanted to know what the hospital could do to, uh, to, to address this and relate to it, and we did. In other cases, it wasn't so much health related, although common denominator is probably everything boils down to your health. But it was the fact that they found out that their students were doing poorly in school, and most of the reasons why they were doing poorly in school is because they were going to school hungry. They were going to school without breakfast, and you can't learn on an empty stomach. And sometimes these same kids were coming home after school with no one there to give them a carrot stick or peanut butter or anything else like that. So then we developed programs and we worked with the school districts. And today, I think mostly every school district that Monongahela Valley Hospital serves has these free breakfast and lunch programs in their school to help these kids be able to have the nutrition, to have the strength that they need to learn. So we, 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 we went to our community and said, what does your community need and how can we respond to this? And, you know, that was in a way... That, that, that's finding their need and responding, responding to it, as opposed to bullshit. Bullshit is, you know, we're going to make sure that no one dies from cancer. Well, we can't make sure that no one dies from cancer. We're going to make sure that everyone who has a stroke is never debilitated, that they'll be able to talk and walk. We can't do that. But we can assess, and now till this day, Monongahela Valley Hospital still does that. They have the educational programs where every month there are doctors that speak. And they speak, and these programs are free. And the public comes in, in addition to, 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 to bring them in. We offer refreshments and everything. There's smoking cessation. There's, you know, how can I prevent myself from falling? We're an elderly community. There's driver's education. There, there's all these kinds of programs to help people lead healthy lives. And if I can piggyback back to our mission, the mission of Mom, Monville Health Resources is Monville Health Resources. The mission of Monville Health Resources is to enhance the health of the residents of the Mid Mon Valley community. We can enhance your health. We can help you with your health. We can't avoid you from dying or becoming debilitated from a stroke, but we can. In some instances, we catch a stroke early enough in the emergency room, begin the intervention. Maybe we can restore your speech, but we're not making that promise. We're making the promise that we're going to enhance your health by doing all these activities. A prime example was about three months before I retired, we, op we opened up the Monville Health Plex. It's a big facility on Route 51. You know, two swimming pools, uh, uh, treadmill machines, uh, uh, ellip elliptic machines, bicycles, weights. I took advantage of that. I took advantage of that because on the second floor, we were smart enough to say, we're gonna put cardiac rehabilitation up here. And in order to get reimbursed by Medicare for cardiac rehabilitation, it has to be under the supervision of a doctor. So we're going to put a doctor here all the time. I went through cardiac rehabilitation because I had open heart surgery five years after I retired. 
And I'll tell you what, that was the best 12 weeks I've ever spent. Now, you know, it's, it's about four hours a day. Two hours in the morning for the morning session, two hours in the afternoon for the afternoon session. So you say, how can a physician be kept helping for four hours, busy for four hours a day? Well, that physician happens to be our occupational medicine doctor, who also is doing employee physicals, who's doing drug testing, who's doing all these things for the employers in the Mon Valley who entrust the health of their employees to our healthcare system. Now, there's a number of things I have to go back to, but this was a great, great answer. We talked about the match program, and I want to give the audience a little bit of a background. And I'm going to just give ballpark amounts. Monongahela Valley Hospital is located about 15 miles from the city of Pittsburgh, from downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, the mid Monongahela Valley is something that Tony clarified for me very early in my career there because there's perceptions about the Mon Valley and the mid Monongahela Valley. And the mid Monongahela Valley has about 10 communities that have their own school districts Charleroi, Denora, uh, Ross Traver, Bell Vernon, Mon City, Monongahela, etc. And what Tony's talking about this match program was going out into the community and getting two representatives from the community of each of those 10 and leading a, a community organization to come up with ideas. I want to mention one that came off of this that I have even more to go to, so I'm going to come back to you a little bit then cut back again. You also took those same 10 school districts and you took the Healthy Communities Program, which I thought was a novel idea, where you would take a key employee a leader, a manager, supervisor, or just a dedicated employee from that school district, and they would chair that school district through the whole year and make sure they went out to the school district, met with the principal, met with the superintendent, and did programming for that school. And the Healthy Communities Program at Monongahela Valley Hospital was recognized by the Pennsylvania Hospital Association. Yeah, the Hospital Council of Western Pennsylvania did recognize it. They gave us some sort of an award for it. More importantly, again, going back to the word trust, through that exercise, the school districts trusted us. So much so that when one school district decided to do a long-range plan, they asked one of our senior vice presidents to be on the long-range planning committee to help that district plan for its future. Good stuff. And then one other thing that you touched on that I want to come back to here is I talk a lot about asking what's the big idea because when it comes to messaging, we have to understand both our why or reason for being and our customer's why or reason for buying. We then need to crystallize that into one big idea, one memorable message or theme that makes an emotional impact on our target audiences. So when you mentioned the mission statement of Monville Health Resources, the parent company of Monongahela Valley Hospital, and you mentioned that mission statement, I think that's a heck of a big idea. Talk about how that mission statement was developed and how you used it. Well, we developed it by a strategic long-range planning process that took two years. Uh, it did take us two years to come up with a mission statement, but everything that was going into our strategic plan. And then when we were finished with what we wanted to do with our strategic long-range planning, we decided, well, let's build a mission statement to, to help guide us through it. As a matter of fact, that mission statement, I don't know if it still happens today, but when, when I was there, that mission statement was on every page of the board agenda. So the board chairman can control the conversation and say, does this relate to our mission statement? If it has nothing to do with the enhancement of the health care of, of the residents of Midmont Valley, we're not going to waste any time talking about it. But the mission statement is ingrained. Just yesterday, I had to take my wife to Monongahela Valley Hospital for some x-ray work, and those signs are still there. In every department, on every elevator station, on every employee badge is the mission statement. You turn over the employee badge, it says, the mission of Monville Health Resources, Inc. is to enhance the health of the residents of the mid Mon Valley. You push a button for an elevator, and while you're waiting, there's a sign there. You go into the x-ray department, there's a sign there. Living the mission statement. And the thing about mission statements, Tony, is most of them are bullshit. Well, you know, not only they're bullshit, but one, I also chaired the Long Range Planning Committee for the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania. And we brought in a very, very prestigious consulting company, McKinsey & Company, mm -hmm. you know, nationwide, worldwide. And I remember to that day that the facilitator for McKinsey said, a mission statement should be no longer than one sentence. And right. that's why you have the bullshit now. I mean, I shouldn't refer to it this way because you know, it's sort of religious, but you go into church and look at the mission statement for my church bulletin, it's a half a page. <laughs> No one's going to remember a half a page of what the mission statement of this church is. 
And no one's going to remember anything more than a sentence or two. And that's why we kept our, our simple in one sentence, and it's easy to remember, and it's easy to, 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 to uh, live. And a great example of that, Tony, is I worked for you in the ni late 90s, and I've been gone a while, and I still use the example that you just did as your big idea. I've used that in classes that I've taught. All of my staff have heard me say that mission statement. Why? Because it makes complete sense. It's actually achievable, mm -hmm. and it's memorable mm -hmm. to enhance the health of the residents of the Midmont Valley. Mm -hmm. And you listeners might say, oh, it's simple. No, it's, it's what it should be. That's what a big idea is. For our audience, thanks for joining us for the uh, No Bullshit Marketing Podcast. Visit BoldSolutionsNoBS.com for show notes, plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Sign up for Light Reading. You'll receive proven strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light, tended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit MassSolutions.biz slash blog. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions.